Still a few hours from our destination, along a long stretch of desert highway, when my father turned to me and asked, So, um, uh, what's the big deal with the butt stuff? <laughs> I tried not to react to the question, although I do remember swerving the car a little bit. How did we get to this point in our once icy father-son relationship, I thought. But I knew damn well it was no one's fault but mine. To hear my father tell it, I'd always been a weird kid. When I was six, he'd coached my t-ball team. Years later, while I fondly reminisced over an old team picture, my father surprised me by describing it as the most disappointing moment of my life. <laughs> while I'd never been much of an athlete, I hadn't realized that the entirety of my father's aspirations for me hung solely on my success as a professional t-ball player. In my defense, we didn't live in the best of neighborhoods, and as a result, I wasn't allowed to associate with the kids outside. Where other children my age had parks, sports, and socializing, I had books, movies, and a TV set that seemed to be constantly on at my house. I remember how excited I was the day my father gave me my own little TV set, much to my mother's dismay. He'd tell her, I was raised on TV, and look how I turned out. <laughs> In fact, that man consumed about five or six hours of television a day, which for me seemed like a normal pastime if you were forced to stay inside. It wasn't until years later that it would dawn on me that that was also around the time that my father seemed to lose interest in me as a person. But at the time, not knowing any better, I was happy to retreat into TV land and, as such, proceed to become the very antithesis of the athlete my father had once hoped for. I became an indoor kid. <laughs> in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the term nerd was one of derision. That was decades before it would become the badge of honor it's considered today. Personally, I preferred the term arts enthusiast. <laughs> that was my badge of honor, and I wore it proudly. I could hardly consume enough media, and when I wasn't taking it in, I set out to create some myself. It was to my father's credit that, in a household where I was hardly allowed to touch the microwave for fear of its imminent destruction, he eventually relented and allowed me to use the video camera in order to make movies, and the stereo in order to record audio plays. Although what I initially ascribed to my father's uncharacteristic generosity later turned out to be something else entirely. According to him, it was such a pain in the ass, letting you use the camera was the only thing that kept you from bouncing off the goddamn walls. Whatever the reason, I quickly set out to create. And I never really stopped. Of course, there were attempts at real careers, prompted by my father's urgings to get a goddamn job. In fairness, I had a lot of goddamn jobs, most of which I was pretty goddamn good at, but ultimately, nothing satisfied me like pursuing artistic ventures. Naturally, there were a myriad of false starts, dead ends, and outright failures. But any true artist will tell you, it's all part of the process. At least, that's what we often tell ourselves. But to my father, they all seemed like signs that I should straighten up, fly right, and pursue a more stable path. After a decade of failing to straighten up, however, it must have eventually become clear to him that I was thoroughly dedicated to failing at the arts, and he would eventually stop trying to change my mind. Over the last two decades, I've been involved in a myriad of projects, including a number of short films and digital series, both for myself and various media organizations. After a while, my father stopped complaining, even congratulating me from time to time. But I always knew that nothing I created was ever his cup of tea. That was until my podcast. In the late 2010s, in the wake of yet another breakup, a friend and I decided to turn, start a relationship podcast, certainly not to offer dating advice, as we were both just as jaded and cynical regarding modern romance, but rather as a way to publicly bitch and complain about the string of exes whose specter we both carried around like a steamer trunk of emotional baggage. Certain that no one would want to hear about the love life of two failures, we centered the podcast around the sordid, tumultuous tales of the world's most high-profile couples. It would be an affirmation to lonely hearts everywhere that love was a lie. <laughs> and that even the most rich and beautiful weren't immune to heartbreak. We would call it, You're Gonna Die Alone. <laughs> Slowly but surely, the podcast began to gain traction. At first with our friends who admitted they'd only listened out of a sense of obligation. But later, actively began recommending the show to others. And later with actual strangers who began sending us messages asking that we cover specific couples. To say the podcast was exploitative was an understatement. <laughs> We'd cover fairly mainstream couples whose relationships the general public had widely heard of, but in an attempt to add something new, or, or maybe a fear of being considered boring, we discussed the sordid details as well, 
Desi Arnaz's insatiable appetite for prostitutes, the corruption of Bobby Brown by the not-so-innocent Whitney Houston, Eddie Murphy's alleged transgender fetish, Courtney Love's pregnant heroin use, Johnny Depp's severed finger, and, of course, the persistent rumors of Jackie Kennedy's affair with both Bobby and Ted. In an attempt to insulate ourselves from litigation, we backed every rumor up with 20 hours worth of research, and we're always careful to hide behind the media's magic word, the phrase that has saved or ruined many a career, allegedly. As revealing as we attempted to make the series, the most salacious details by far came from my co-host and I. As the series continued and we steadily became more comfortable with our unseen audience, Kristen and I would regularly relate tales not only of past relationships, but of past sexual exploits. We would often regale, or perhaps object, the audience to stories of sexual discovery, including our earliest experiences with the act of physical love, all the way to experimental phases, such as my numerous failed attempts at successfully participating in a three-way, a venture that would always either fail to launch or end in outright humiliation and disaster. There were also numerous tales of sexual experimentation, including with the opposite sex. Again, in an effort to avoid seeming boring, we'd refer to sex as boinking, spelunking the mole hole, <laughs> parting the pink sea, mounting the baloney pony, observing Taco Tuesday, <laughs> or simply riding the beef bus into Tuna Town. <laughs> we'd often refer to our respective body parts as sweater melons, meat wallets, spasm chasms, vulverines, clam hammers, yam bags, and ham candles. <laughs> Euphemisms aside, I'm not quite sure what drove us to openly share the most intimate details of our personal lives with complete strangers. Things we would never dream of openly sharing with those closest to us, but we did, and it somehow felt good to be so open about it, particularly with people we'd never meet. Which is why I was so horrified the day my father asked to listen to my podcast. <laughs> Perhaps out of a sense of familial obligation, or maybe just boredom, I had agreed to take a week off and drive my father to Texas to visit an ailing relative. In his later years, he'd developed a fear of flying, which was just another of the multitude of things we didn't have in common. Within the first few minutes of our two-day drive, it became clear just how long the trip would be when we clashed over what to listen to. I'd prefer not to listen to his smooth jazz CDs, and my father refused to listen to my classic rock playlist, insisting that I already listened to that shit in the 70s and 80s, enough already. <laughs> talking would... <laughs> talking would, of course, be out of the question. We hadn't said much to each other over the past few decades, and it would somehow seem contrived and dishonest to start now. Well, he finally said to me, what about that radio program you do? It hadn't occurred to me to even suggest one of my podcasts, as he'd never much liked anything I produced. Then again, it would make sense that a man who'd spent the better part of his life watching TV might actually be interested in the private lives of the celebrities he was so familiar with. So, at the next gas station, I downloaded a few episodes for him to choose from. To my surprise, he chose an episode on Khloe Kardashian and Lamar Odom. <laughs> Two figures I didn't realize my father even knew existed. And we proceeded to listen to the episode in silence. An hour later, as the episode ended, I was surprised to hear my father say, those Kardashian women, they, they really ruin their men, don't they? Christ, I, I remember when Bruce Jenner was still a man. <laughs> Upon expressing surprise at the astuteness of his comment, he assured me that he hardly misses an episode of what I was surprised to find out was one of his favorite shows, the daily gossip series, TMZ. But what he told me next surprised me even more. You and your co-host there, uh, you, you got some good chemistry. That show of yours, it's pretty interesting. Before I had time to decide whether or not he was humoring me, he quelled all doubts when he said, well, let's listen to another one. So we listened to another one, and another one after that. And with every episode, he silently took in not only the celebrity gossip, but also the personal stories, my personal stories. Those of my disastrous romantic history, dating habits and sexual exploits, my casual experimentation with members of the same sex, and instances of sexual adventurousness and discovery. Maybe it was the vulgar language we used to describe it all that made it somehow more digestible. He even chuckled a few times at the vulgarity, like when I informed my co-host that I had, quote, been tongue-jabbed in the shitbox this weekend. 
But it was most likely my brutal openness on the podcast that eventually led to his brutal openness when, between episodes, my father turned to me and asked, So, uh, what's the big deal with the butt stuff? It should be noted that while I was growing up, my father never once made a single effort to sit down and explain the birds and the bees. If he was somehow trying to make up for it now, I thought, this is a hell of a place to start. <laughs> well, I said, what do you want to know? <laughs> well, what's the big whoop with all the kids licking each other's butts these days? <laughs> are, are, are people just, are people just gayer than they were before? <laughs> I explained to my father that, from what I understood, the act commonly known as analingus was quickly becoming mainstream among people of all sexual preferences. The things that his generation might have stigmatized as taboo were just the norms of today. Give me a break. What, what, what do you think, your generation invented premarital sex? While I knew we hadn't, I admit I'd never given much thought to the sex lives of past generations. We all try things. It's human nature. Hell, there was a period of time I only dated black women for obvious reasons. Somehow that statement managed to throw me off even more than my dad's butt stuff question. <laughs> Mainly because there was a period of time when I only dated black women. And my mind was suddenly flooded with thoughts of my father having the same tastes and preferences as me. He said he dated black women for obvious reasons. What were those reasons? <laughs> were they the same reasons I had for dating black women? Were his somehow racist? Were mine somehow racist? Before I could obsess further, he once again interjected. Look, I don't mean gay isn't bad. I, I, I just mean gay isn't different. This too confused me. I immediately thought back to the time back in my college years when I had invited a group of guys over to my parents' house where I was still living to sit around, get drunk, and watch the 1980s comedic masterpiece, Airplane. Halfway through, my father walked in, took one look around, and loudly asked, "Hey." Where the hell are the ladies? What are you guys, gay? The room grew silent as everyone awkwardly turned to our gay friend, Fernando, <laughs> who raised his hand and said, actually, I am. My father pretended to cringe, almost in a mock conciliatory manner, then walked over to Fernando and jovially patted him on the back before bursting into laughter. Then, much to my relief, one by one, the rest of the guys burst into laughter including Fernando, and we went back to watching Airplane and getting hammered. You know, Dad, I said finally, I know a lot of gay people and their sexual tastes are just as diverse as any other group. What do you think, I don't know gays? I know gays, I grew up with gays. This is a surprise to me as well. Remember my cousin Gus, he's gay. He was gay from day one. Hell, we, we must have all known he was gay before he even knew he was gay. When I asked how they all knew he was gay, my father was quiet for a moment and chuckled to himself. We'd all go trick-or-treating together as kids, and uh, one year he insisted on going as Carmen Miranda. While I hadn't known my Uncle Gus was gay, rather than being shocked, I was too busy doing the math in my head. If they were kids when this occurred, then it must have been sometime in the early 1950s. The first question came to, that came to my head was whether or not any of the kids gave him a hard time. Of course not. Nobody gave Gus a hard time. Why was that, I asked him. Because the other kids knew we kicked the shit out of them if they did. Somehow, somehow this surprised me most of all. My father and I sat in silence for what seemed like an eternity. I couldn't imagine what he'd say next until he did. Look, what a man does with his dick is none of my goddamn business. But, in, but the ass, I, I don't know. I, I don't get it. Well, I said, I guess it's just not for you, Dad. I mean... Even for me, it isn't a thing I do every day, but every now and then, in the heat of passion, I guess the mood just catches you. <laughs> At this, he was once again silent for a long while. We may have sat in silence for an hour, or it may have just been a few seconds, but it seemed like forever before he finally spoke. So, uh, what, uh, what does it taste like? I quickly gathered my thoughts before turning to him with a response. Honestly, Dad? Pennies. <laughs>
At that, my father and I proceeded to share what may have been our first genuine laugh together. At least the first one I could remember. Well, he finally said, let's listen to another one.